It is now time to understand what are the impacts of inflation in the context of our equilibrium business cycle model. Let's assume perfect foresight, that is, that households can fully anticipate inflation and consequently the inflation rate equals the expected inflation rate. We will now extend our framework to allow for money growth. New amounts of currency are distributed as transfer payments from the government to households in a lump sum manner, such that the amount received is independent of how much the household consumes, works, how much money it holds in the first place, and so forth. Note that the expected real interest rate has intertemporal effects on consumption and labor supply. Therefore, for a given nominal interest rate, a change in the inflation rate will lead to intertemporal substitution effects. Lastly, note also that the no arbitrage condition between the returns to bonds and capital still holds, but now with respect to the real rate of return. The real interest rate on earning assets are is given by the difference between the nominal interest and inflation rate. Note that the real interest rate on money, the real return on money, is just the negative of the inflation rate. The difference between the two real rates is i minus pi, minus minus pi. This equals i, the nominal interest rate. Therefore, the nominal interest rate still determines the cost of holding money and no changes are made to the real money demand equation. Note that it is the real interest rate that has intertemporal substitution effects on consumption and labor supply. However, it is the nominal interest rate, I, that influences the real demand for money. We had seen for before that the one-time increases in prices was neutral. That is, it did not change either the demand or supply of capital and services. But just as before, a change in the inflation rate doesn't affect the demand for capital services. It must equate the marginal product of capital, which, for a given rental price, does not change. In terms of supply, first, the stock of capital is fixed. Second, the capital utilization rate kappa is also unchanged for a given real rental price of capital. So neither the supply or demand change, and hence the market for capital services has no change in quantities or real equilibrium price. What about labor? In terms of demand, the argument is essentially the same. For a given real wage rate, the demand for labor equates the marginal product, so nothing changes. However, labor supply, in principle, could change if the change in inflation implies some income effect. This could happen because inflation has an impact on real money balances and can affect the optimal money management strategy leading to changes in the amount of resources needed for that purpose. We will assume, however, that this is small enough in normal times such that it can be ignored, and thus conclude that labor quantities and equilibrium real wage remain also unchanged. What about real GDP, consumption and investment? Well, if inputs, capital services and labor are unchanged, then output is unchanged too. Continue to ignore income effects from inflation is also straightforward to claim that consumption does not change, and consequently neither does investment since output is fixed. To the extent that changes in inflation rate reflect changes in money growth, we have found that the time paths of money growth and inflation do not affect real variables. Therefore, our earlier results on the neutrality of money, which refer to a one-time change in the nominal quantity m, apply as an approximation to the entire path of money growth. We call this the super neutrality of money. Let's go back to the equilibrium in the money market, such that money supply is equal to money demand. Let's assume also that real GDP grows at rate gamma and prices at the rate pi, the inflation rate. Then it must be the case for the money market to clear over time that the growth rate of money mu must equate the sum of the inflation rate pi and the growth rate of real GDP gamma. Remember that at the beginning of this lecture, we showed that in the data, the median growth of real money balances was about 4.6%. In our framework, this equals to mu minus pi. And our equation tells us that this growth rate should be equal to the growth rate of real GDP. We had found in the data 
that the median growth rate of GDP was about 3.35%, not that different from our prediction. The overall conclusion is that in the long run, since we are taking 40 year or more averages of aggregates, Friedman seemed to be correct in claiming that inflation is, and everywhere, a monetary phenomenon. Inflation reflects growth in money growth, with the difference being the increase in real demand for money coming from a growth in real GDP. We should make one remark. Suppose that the monetary authority raises the money growth rate from mu to mu prime in year t, and assume no growth in real GDP just to keep this simple. Then we have that before the intervention, inflation was equal to the growth rate of money supply, and that after the intervention, inflation will now be equal to the new growth rate of money supply. However, remember that the nominal interest rate is given by the sum of the inflation and real rates. Assuming the real rate to be unchanged, recall the money superneutrality result, then a one-time increase in the money growth rate mu will lead to a one-time increase in the nominal interest rate that will now change from i to i prime. This one-time change in the nominal interest rate will lead to a decrease in money demand and a one-time shift upwards in the price level. This means that in the period of the policy change, inflation is higher than the change in the growth rate of money. This can be observed by looking at this figure. The dark blue line shows that the nominal quantity of money, mt, grows at the constant rate mu before year t. After year t, mt grows along the black line at the higher rate mu prime. The light blue line shows that the price level pt grows at the same rate as money, mu, before year t. After year t, pt grows along the light blue line at the same rate as money, mu prime. The price level, PT, jumps upwards during year T. This jump is a consequence of the decrease in real money demand from the level prevailing before year T to that prevailing after year T. Good to keep in mind that an increase in the growth rate of money creation leads to exceptionally high inflation in the change period. Let's now look how printing money can be a source of revenue for the government. So far, we have assumed that the monetary authority prints new money and distributes it to households as a lump sum transfer. But in principle, the monetary authority could print money and give it to the government for purchases of goods and services. Let's see what the implications of that would be. First, start by noting that the nominal revenue from printing money is given by the difference in nominal money balances between two periods. How many goods and services can the government buy with that extra money? Just divide by the price level in T plus 1 to get the real revenue from printing money. Notice that the growth rate of money is defined as delta MT over MT. Use that to substitute out delta MT in the real revenue from printing money expression to get mu T times MT over PT plus 1. Now, let's look at the effects of a change in the money growth rate delta mu t. There is an obvious direct effect. An increase in mu t will increase the real revenue from printing money. However, remember that an increase in mu t also increases the nominal interest rate, because, as we analyzed before, the nominal interest rate is equal to the real rate plus inflation. Abstracting from growth, we know that inflation is equal to the money growth rate. Hence, if the latter increases, so will the inflation rate, and consequently the normal interest rate, by an amount equal to the increase in mu t. The rise in the nominal interest rate will lead to a decrease in money demand, a one-time increase in the price level, and a decrease in money balances, and consequently in the real revenue from printing money. Which effect predominates? It will essentially depend on how much will money demand respond to an increase in the nominal interest rate. As an example, suppose that real money balances M over P were initially equal to 100, and that mu T doubled from 5% to 10% per year. The net real revenue from printing money would rise unless M over P fell below 50, that is, by more than 50%. 
More generally, the real revenue rises, unless the decrease in quantity of real money demanded is proportionally larger than the increase in the money growth rate. This condition holds empirically, except for the most extreme cases. For example, during the German hyperinflation, the condition was violated only when mu approached 100% per month, between July and August 1923. Until then, the government extracted more real revenue by printing money at a faster rate. In normal times, for most countries, the government obtains only a small portion of its revenue from printing money. Considering the continued expansionary monetary policy carried out after the financial crisis in 2014, the Federal Reserve obtained $97 billion from this source, a significant increase of $24 billion over the 2005 figure prior to the financial crisis. This amount constituted 3.2% of total federal receipts and half a percent of GDP. In a few high inflation countries, the revenue from printing money became much more important. For example, in Argentina, from 1960 to 1975, money creation accounted for nearly half of government revenue and about 6% of GDP. Some other countries in which the revenue from printing money was important were Chile, raising around 5% of GDP between 1960 and 1977, Libya, raising 3% of GDP from 1960 to 1977, and Brazil, raising 3% of GDP between 1960 and 1978. John Maynard Keynes observed that money creation became the main source of government receipts during the German and Russian hyperinflations after World War I. A government can live for a long time, even in the German government or the Russian government, by printing paper money. That is to say, it can by this means secure the command over real resources. Resources just as real as those obtained by taxation. In some hyperinflations, the revenue approached 10% of GDP, which seems to be about the maximum attainable from printing money. In Germany, from 1920 to 1923, a close connection existed between real government spending and the money growth rate. Much of this spending went towards reparation payments to the victors of World War I. Therefore, the reduction in these payments after November 1923 was a major factor in ending the German hyperinflation. Note that hyperinflation is defined as a process when prices increase in a rapid, excessive and out-of-control way. It is typically caused when the government begins printing money to pay for its spending. To keep from paying more tomorrow, people begin hoarding. That stockpiling creates shortages. It starts with durable goods, such as automobiles or washing machines. If hyperinflation continues, people hoard perishable goods, like bread and milk. These daily supplies become scarce and the economy falls apart. People lose their life savings as cash becomes worthless. For that reason, the elderly are the most vulnerable to hyperinflation. Soon, banks and lenders go bankrupt since their loans lose value. They run out of cash as people stop making deposits. Hyperinflation sends the value of the currency plummeting in foreign exchange markets. The nation's importers go out of business as the cost of foreign goods skyrockets. Unemployment rises as companies fold. Then government tax revenues fall and has trouble providing basic services. The government prints more money to pay its bills, worsening the hyperinflation. There are two winners in hyperinflation. First, those who took out loans. They find higher prices make their debt worthless by comparison until it is virtually wiped out. Exporters are also winners. The falling value of the local currency makes exports cheaper compared to foreign competitors. Exports receive hard foreign currency, which increases in value as the local currency falls. However, the economic disruption that follows rends, renders all of this meaningless. Note that hyperinflation is not something that far removed from current times. Zimbabwe had hyperinflation between 2004 and 2009. The government printed money to pay for the war in the Congo. Also, droughts and farm confiscation restricted the supply of food and other locally produced goods. As a result, hyperinflation was worse than in Germany. The inflation rate was 98% a day, and prices doubled every 24 hours. 
It finally ended when the country changed its currency to the US dollar. The most recent example of hyperinflation can be found in Venezuela. Prices rose 41% in 2013, 63% in 2014, 121% in 2015, 481% in 2016, 1,642% in 2017, 2,880% in 2018, and it was projected to grow 3,497% in 2019. In 2017, the government increased the money supply by 14%. It is promoting a new cryptocurrency, the Petro, because the Bolivar lost nearly all its value against the US dollar. Venezuela cannot afford the cost of printing new paper currency. The IMF projected prices to rise 13,000% in 2018. In response, people began using eggs as currency. A carton of eggs was worth 250,000 bolivars, compared to 6,740 in January 2017. Unemployment rose to 21%, similar to the US rate during the Great Depression. How did Venezuela create such a mess? Former President Hugo Chavez had instituted price controls for food and medicine. But mandated prices were so low, it forced domestic companies out of business. In response, government paid for imports. In 2014, however, oil prices plummeted. It eroded revenues to the government-owned oil companies. When the government ran out of cash, it started printing more. Rather than change its dangerous price and wage controls, President Nicolás Maduro continued the unsustainable policies.